said. Amen. Amen. The grace of God. Most beautifully and perfectly expressed in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 20. <coughs> Excuse me. We're continuing our study in verses 13 through 38. Acts chapter 20, Farewell to Ephesus, part 3. It's a fascinating passage of Scripture, and it helps us to understand what both the approach to the message and the content of the message should be as we go about our daily lives. This is written, or it's spoken to, and then recorded for us as Paul's speech to the Ephesian elders. But as we look at his approach, and as we look at his content, we discover some very important things that we just sang about in that song, Grace, Grace, Marvelous Grace. Grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. The grace of God that brings salvation that appeared unto all men, teaching us to denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. The grace of God teaches us something about our life, how we should live. Paul's going to emphasize the grace of God in this message to the Ephesian elders. But grace is not the freedom to sin. It's the ability, the empowerment, and the directive, the motivation not to sin. To live a holy life pleasing to God. It's not the motivation of the law, but it is the motivation of love. And we'll see that tonight as we look at our text. We're in Acts chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 13 through 38. And we went to fort a ship and sailed unto Assos, there intending to take in Paul, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Assos, we took him in and came to Mytilene. We sailed thence and came the next day over to Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at Tregilium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. <coughs> and from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons serving the Lord with all humility of mind, with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. <laughs> but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. It's a major theme here. And now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Very interesting phrase there. We started tonight by singing, I love thy kingdom, Lord. That's been mistaken, especially in reformed circles, as to what in the world we're talking about, and how does it relate to the grace of God. I hope we have time for that tonight. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Do you know where the Apostle Paul is quoting from when he says that? very important passage of scripture gives us a transdispensational principle. Remember, there are many different ways to approach this text tonight, seven different ways we've discussed. We're going to see some of those tonight. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Pretty thorough systematic theology that Paul preached. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. 
Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. There we have it again. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The law does not build you up, but grace does. The law only condemns, but grace builds you up. which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Inheritance under the law comes at death. Inheritance under grace comes while you're alive. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things. What you believe affects how you live. What you believe will be an example to the believers, as Paul writes to young Timothy, to be an example. Paul didn't just preach and tell them, this is what you're supposed to do. Follow what I say, not what I do. Paul showed them how to live. Dear friends, it's not enough to know theology. You can have everything in the right category, but if you don't live it, if you don't show it, no one will believe you and no one will obey it. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring, you ought to support the weak. Don't wish for your own rights. Too many of us are focused on our rights instead of being focused on our responsibilities. Americans are all about rights. Christians are all about responsibility. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. You know, it's interesting, he's just given them a severe warning. You would think that they would sorrow that grievous wolves are going to come in from the outside and attack. Or the grievous wolves are going to rise up from among them and attack. What they were doing was saying goodbye to their shepherd. That's what gave them the greatest sorrow. A lot of pathos in that passage. Now as we look at this somewhat extended section of scripture, we've noted that there are seven different ways in which it can be approached historically, prophetically, doctrinally, personally, a study of the impelling will of God, a study for finishing the end of a ministry and the end of life, and a crash, crash course for church leadership. We started out by looking last week at why Paul wanted to be at Jerusalem for Pentecost. He had a vow on him. We learned that back in chapter 18, you recall, two chapters ago. After this, Paul tarried yet a good while, and then he took leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head, for he had a vow. And we saw that in Acts chapter 18, uh, when he gets nabbed and brought before Gallio, the deputy of Achaia, they're claiming that he fails to follow or to teach the law. And Gallio said, that's your problem, not mine. And he drove him out of his judgment seat and all the Greek stook and beat Sosthenes, who was the ruler of the synagogue. And Sosthenes later gets converted uh, and becomes a vibrant Christian. And we've talked about that in the past. Paul fulfilled his obligations 
that he had made prior to his salvation under the law. And so now we will see more about that in chapter 21, but tonight we're at part three, Farewell to Ephesus, and we learn a number of very important principles that apply not only to church leaders, but apply to church members as well. Remember, their wives and their children were with them there also, it says so in the text. Church leaders and all of us, note the first major thing that stands out in this passage. Teach everything that is profitable, but major on the majors, not on the minors. Teach everything that is profitable, but major on the majors and not on the minors. When you go to certain denominational churches, you will find that they preach only two or three things, and they preach them a hundred different ways, but it's always the same theme. And they focus on their denominational distinctives. We're going to discover tonight what Paul thought were the majors. He declared unto them all the counsel of God, it says so in the text. But he specifically pulls certain things out to emphasize and say, this is what you must focus on if you would be faithful in doctrine. Now all of us, because of our background, have certain favorite subjects that we like to talk about. I know I love to talk about predestination. I love to talk about election. I love to talk about the sovereignty of God. I love to talk about all those great, powerful doctrines of the faith. And they are powerful doctrines. The whole chapters are given to them in various books of the Apostle Paul. But that's not where you stay. There are other things that must be emphasized, because if you don't emphasize other things, very soon people become complacent. But after all, they're among the elect. They're the frozen chosen. They have no obligation to proclaim the gospel of Christ to anyone else. The Christian life is a balance. We need to remember that. It's a balance, yes, between the sovereignty of God and human responsibility. But the content is more than the sovereignty of God. The content also includes the accountability of each one of us as believers for communicating the truth of the word of God in all of its entirety. That's what Paul did. He says so two or three times here in the passage. All of the counsel of God, every place we go. Remember, Paul had been at Ephesus for three years. Paul had plenty of time to cover a lot of basic Bible doctrine. Paul was very systematic in his teaching. Paul was also moved by the Holy Spirit and was given revelatory gifts so that he could communicate everything that was essential, everything that was necessary, both for those people and for us today. Because God chose the specific things that Paul wrote from the things that he said and condensed it for us in most of the New Testament because most was written by Paul outside of the Gospels. So let's look at some of the majors that Paul talked about. First he said to teach everything. That was verse 20. He says, how I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Interesting. What he talked about when he spoke of everything, he talked about it in terms of profitability. Now there's another passage of scripture, and I hope it immediately popped into your mind as you heard that word profitable. 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. So if he kept back nothing that was profitable to them, what was he teaching? Was he teaching uh, the latest gossip? Was he teaching political content? Or was he teaching the word of God? I have kept back nothing that was profitable to you. What Paul is saying there in a nutshell is he expounded all the scriptures. Now folks, some time ago, I did a series here on Christ in all the scriptures. 
How many of you remember that? We went through every book. Yes, good. At least a few remembered. Uh, we went through every book of the Bible and saw how every book points to Christ. Now, I hope that if I named a few of the minor prophets, Habakkuk, or Zephaniah, Zechariah, Malachi, I hope you'd be able to tell me, where is Christ in those Old Testament prophets? He's there. We saw it. We see him in the book of Jonah. That would be an easy one for you, of course. Jesus says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, even so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. But suppose I pulled out Hosea. Now, if you were paying attention this morning and a couple of weeks ago, you would know where Jesus is in Hosea. You should know where Jesus is in Zechariah. Are you familiar with Zechariah chapter 12 and 14? It talks about some of the things we discussed this morning. About the return of Christ, the deliverance of Jerusalem. Every book of Scripture points to Christ. So when the Apostle Paul declared unto them all the counsel of God as he expounded everything to them that was profitable, there was a specific focus, and we'll see that in our text in just a moment. There was a specific focus as he went through all the scriptures. It was all profitable to them because there were two key doctrines, and we'll see that in just a second, that he focused on that have tentacles that stick out into every area of life. Two theological doctrines that are life-changing. It's not merely enough to know it. If you know it in your head and it never reaches your heart, it does you no good. True theology, believed consistently, is life-changing. And that's what Paul is reminding them of here in Acts chapter 20. So number one, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Now what were some of the things that he majored on? Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance and faith. Those are two key issues that the Apostle Paul focused on. Now to preach repentance, what do you have to preach about? How nice everybody is? How we're all warm and fuzzy? And how there are lots of good people in the world? Or when you're preaching repentance, you have to preach about sin. You remember what I preached about this morning? Why does the judgment of God come? Because God is using it to bring people to repentance. We talked about how that is the key to the law of harvest. We talked about how when you see the locusts coming into your life and eating up your labors, and you examine your life and you say, God's chastening hand is upon me, what is the proper response? It's repentance. It's not covering it over. It's not making excuses for it. It's not calling it mistakes. It's calling it sin. Examining yourself with the light of Scripture because that's profitable to you. As you take the Word of God and as you honestly apply it to your own life and don't hold back on that, as you apply it to your own life and you see sin in your own life, you say, yes, Lord, your word says this is sin. I'm going to quit making excuses about it. I will repent. Metanoia is the Greek word for repentance. It means to make a 180 degree about face. You are going east and you repent. You turn around and you go west. You're going north and you repent. You turn around and you go south. That's the idea that is given with the word repentance. You were doing one thing and you saw that it was not pleasing to God and so you didn't just sort of make a slight change in direction hoping you could get away with it. You said, Lord, this is sin and I repent and I turn around and I go the other way. 
repentance toward God. How have you offended God? It's not repentance about how your mother-in-law feels about something. It's repentance toward God. It's not repentance toward whatever the political situation is. It's repentance toward God. What does God say? God, you said it. I believe it. And it changes my life. That's what settles it. The proof that it settles it is what shows up in your life. Not glibly simply saying, yes, God, that's the way it's supposed to be, and you keep on going down the road that you've been going down all these, time, all these years. It changes your life. You know my question. I ask this when people tell me they're a Christian. I say, oh, really? You say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? Because when you're really a Christian, it's not merely a package of theology that you've got in your head. It is transformational. It is transformational when you trust Christ. So that's the first thing, a major repentance toward God, which includes the whole bowl of wax about sin and about judgment. People don't like to hear those things. But that's the first thing he says he preached understand that that's the reason why the law is preached. It's not for salvation. It's not for sanctification. And unfortunately, in our circles, many people are preaching the law, and they love to study the Ten Commandments, and they love to study the details of the law, but they don't understand the purpose of the law. It's to show us that we are under condemnation from a holy and righteous God. It's designed to lead us to repentance. It's not designed for us to try to copy and imitate the law so that we can be good little boys and girls. It's designed to show us we can't. To show us that there's a holy God who judges sin. It's designed to lead us to Christ. The law was given, Paul says, as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Because you cannot be saved by the law. You cannot be sanctified by the law. The reason the law is preached is to show you that you're a sinner, that you need to repent, you need to trust in the grace of God. And Paul's going to talk about that in just a second here in this passage. That's another one of the majors that he majors on. Repentance toward God. And then, the flip side of that coin, and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. See, those two things are both on one coin. If you look at a penny, nickel, or dime, or quarter, or penny that's in your pocket, most of us probably only have pennies. But if you look at it, it's got two sides to it, doesn't it? Uh, it normally has the face of somebody on one side, and it has some other decoration on the back side. But it's one coin. So Paul puts these two things together. Repentance for God. That deals with sin and with judgment. And with our understanding that we have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and we repent. The other side of that coin is faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough to be sorry for your sin. It's not enough to quit doing your sin. You see, that still lives, leaves you in a, in a lost condition. You have to have faith. And the content of your faith is very specific. Our Lord Jesus Christ. A lot of things that are tied up in that three-word phrase. First, who are we talking about? Jesus. We're talking about the Christ of Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ that the Bible reveals. Not some, some Christ or some Jesus who is a different Jesus. Paul says, I'm worried about you all because, you know... Somebody might preach a different gospel. They might preach a different Jesus. You might receive a different spirit. He says, I'm talking about the Jesus that the Bible reveals. Christ, Christos. That's the Greek translation of Mashiach, which is the Hebrew word Messiah. As you trace those words through Scripture, Messiah and Christ, you discover there is a specific content who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Paul's going to cover that in this passage also, but who Jesus is, he's both God and man. And he talks about God purchasing the church with 
his own blood. That gives you both the deity and the humanity of Christ. Jesus is both God Almighty, undiminished God Almighty, and he's also a perfect sinless man who was able to shed his blood, for without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sin. That's who Jesus is. What he did, and Paul will talk about that here also, he died for our sins, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the bare basic bones of what's called the gospel, the good news in scripture, who Jesus is and what he did. Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. That tells you the gospel by which you are saved, who Jesus is and what he did. In 1 Corinthians, Paul spends the entire time talking about part of that content, which is the resurrection of Christ and how essential that is. The rest of it makes no sense at all if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul taught that Jesus was Lord. Not merely that he was Savior, but that he was Lord. What does it mean to have someone who is your Lord? I mean, someone who's really the boss. Someone who is in control of everything. Someone to whom you answer, yes, sir. You don't argue with him. You don't suggest alternatives. When he tells you to do something, you say, yes, sir, and you say it cheerfully. Because you know that what he tells you to do is always best for you, as well as most beautifully fulfilling his purpose and commission in your life. Is Jesus really Lord of your life, or is he merely your Savior? Faith toward our Lord. Jesus Christ. Now we're not talking lordship salvation here. There are those who teach that if Jesus isn't Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Well, that's a half truth. You didn't have to understand everything that Jesus wanted you to do before you got saved. You merely needed to know that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again. But as you begin to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, you begin to learn that he expects total obedience. He doesn't like arguments. He doesn't like sassiness. He doesn't like comeback. He likes to hear the words, yes, sir. Whatever you say that, I will do. The Apostle Paul demonstrates that for us here in our text tonight. The Apostle Paul says, yeah, I know all the problems out there. I know all the suffering I'm going to have to go through. But this is what God wants me to do. He's clearly revealed it. Is that how you respond when the Lord Jesus Christ gives you direction from his word? The first two big things we see, testifying both the Jews and also the Greeks. In other words, this is not merely a provision that God has made for the Jews because they've been so bad. It's Jews and Greeks, the Jews and Gentiles. This includes everybody. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That brings us to verse 24, which is the third major thing that Paul taught that was profitable. The third, third major. There are a lot of other things we covered here. But the third major thing is to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. When you're talking to people, it's not a matter of telling stories, it's not a matter of making jokes, it's not a matter of human reasoning. What we testify of is the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel deals with grace, not law. We have to have repentance and faith toward God. Faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God, faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance deals with sin. Repentance deals with judgment. Repentance deals with the law. But the message that saves is the gospel of the grace of God. How that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How we didn't deserve what God wanted to give to us. But God found a way because he loved us. While we were dead in trespasses and sins. 
Christ died for us. He loved us not because of who we were, but in spite of who we were. Sin is heinous in the sight of a holy God. It's unbelievably vile and, to use a modern term, yucky. If you saw some filthy, decaying animal on the side of the road that had been hit by a car and the vultures were eating it, would you go over to it and hug it? Would you stick your hand inside of it to feel if it was still warm? Would you take a deep breath if it had been lying on the road for two or three days to smell the aroma? Our sin in the sight and nostrils of a holy God is worse than that. We were putrefying, rotting, corrupted corpses. We were not sick. We were dead like the dead animal by the road. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Yet God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Until you understand how wicked your sin is, you will never understand the depth of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. We'll be saying more about that, the Lord willing, a little bit later on. And then verse 25, we find the fourth major thing that the Apostle Paul taught that was profitable. Remember, majoring on the majors, minoring on the minors, but teaching all things. But you major on the majors. Verse 25, he says, I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. So, nothing that was profitable did he keep back. He taught both Jews and Greeks repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. He testified the gospel of the grace of God. He's summarizing things for us here. And he says, I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. You all won't see my face anymore. The kingdom of God. Now, we're going to talk about that in a little more detail because that's one of the things that I think has been confused ever since the days of the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church said that they were the kingdom of God. The Reformers looked at it and said, no, you're the kingdom of the devil. And they looked around, they didn't see the kingdom of God anywhere, so they said, we're the kingdom of God. The Roman Catholic Church said, we're the true Israel of God. The Reformers looked at it and said, you're not the true Israel of God. Looked around, didn't see the true Israel of God. Israel as a nation wasn't back in the land yet. And so they said, we're the true Israel of God. And so there's a lot of confusion about the kingdom of God, and there's a lot of confusion about the Israel of God as to what in the world is being spoken of. We'll learn more of that because we can follow what Paul taught about the kingdom of God and about Israel and the church as we look into his doctrinal epistles. But he summarizes for us here a very important issue. I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. You'll see my face no more. Then we get down to verse 17 and following. It says, From Miletus he sent to Ephesus, and he called the elders of the church. And when they were come unto him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. He's telling them, go back to day one. See if you can find anything in my lifestyle, anything, starting with day one, from the day you first met me, until this very day when I'm saying goodbye to you. Can you find anything that was not the way that God wanted it to be? I've showed you, not just I've taught you. Verse 20, I kept back nothing profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, public and private, I did two things. I showed it to you. That is, you could look at my life and see how this thing works out. And I taught you. In other words, how can you apply it to your life? You can examine me, said the Apostle Paul, and you'll see both halves of the equation. You'll see it lived out in my life. You will hear it taught in my words, because my words explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. If you and I live that way, do you think it would make a difference in our families? Now, I know none of us are perfect. The Apostle Paul had his act down a whole lot better than any of us do. 
But do you think that if we lived what we were preaching, if we consistently lived what we were preaching, that it might make a difference? You know, you make one mistake, you do something wrong, you say something wrong. You know what people remember? And they'll remember it years later. I've had my kids do this to me. I'll be emphasizing my authority or something, and then they will bring up an incident that happened maybe two, three, four, ten years ago. And they'll use that as an excuse for why they don't have to obey or why they don't have to listen. Dear folks, Paul said, I showed you and I taught you. It's important for us to both have both halves of that equation, living it out so that you can prove what it is that you're teaching, how the gospel transforms a life, not merely stimulates the intellect. Second lesson, be consistent and transparent. Be consistent and transparent. If you're doing it right, don't change your lifestyle or doctrine. If you're doing it wrong, repent. <laughs> I mean, that's basically what Paul is saying here. Be consistent and transparent. You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, what manner I have been with you at all seasons. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every week, every month, and every year. Be consistent and be transparent. You know, you've seen it. Third, third principal lesson out of this passage is preach content. When you're communicating to someone else, communicate content. Preach the word. Realizing that sometimes you will receive specific direction where to preach and where not to preach. You know, as I was thinking on that subject of preach the word, which is what Paul is telling him he just did, a passage came to mind that we've already looked at four chapters earlier. Acts chapter 16. Verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the regions of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Now the content didn't change, but where you got to preach it may change. We were forbidden to preach the word. Paul later on exhorts Timothy, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. And we'll look at that passage in just a second. But there may come a time when you are commanded not to preach the word. The Apostle Paul had specific groups of people to whom he no longer would preach the word. Remember, there was a turning point. There was a drop-off point when the Jews no longer wanted to hear. And Paul says, you're seeing that you reject eternal life. We're going to the Gentiles. They had passed their point of no return. They would not hear Paul preaching to them anymore. Not because they were like Ephesus, but because they had rejected the word of God. There may be a place where you're not to preach the word. Paul wanted to go east, and God said, go west. What a difference that made in world history as to which nations became the Christian nations and then spread the gospel to other parts of the world. Suppose the gospel had gone east instead via the Apostle Paul. And, and so India was reached and China was reached and Japan was reached and Korea was reached first with the gospel of Christ. The Holy Spirit forbade it. He said, go west. Preaching the word, that's the content. Paul tells them he's preached content to them. And that's what he tells young Timothy to do in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now we're going to talk about Paul preached the kingdom of God to them. Paul explains what he's talking about here when he speaks to Timothy. When he judges the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Paul is talking eschatologically. The Apostle Paul was talking future things. 
not talking about the church right now is the kingdom of God. There are some mystery aspects of the kingdom, and we're not going to discuss that in detail tonight. But Paul was principally talking eschatology. He was talking about things to come. Why? We'll see in a moment. There's a specific reason why Paul taught them eschatology. A specific reason why, for example, I brought in the book of Revelation this morning while we're talking about locusts in, in the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus gives us a temporal visual model that's very much, much smaller than things to come. But it helps us to understand in concrete terms about what is God is going to do in the future. Paul says, I went about preaching the kingdom of God, and so you preach it. God is going to judge the quick and the dead. Brings us back to the issue of sin. Brings us back to the issue of repentance. Brings us back to the issue of faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He's telling Timothy the same thing that he's telling the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. Who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing. Has he come back yet? No. And his kingdom. Has the kingdom happened yet? No. There's going to be a literal 1,000 year reign of Christ on the earth. And it's still future when Paul writes to Timothy. And he's writing this in his very last epistle at the end of his life. It had not come at that time. 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote that we have before he was killed. Preach the word. <laughs> Just what we were looking about here in Acts chapter 20. Paul says, I'm passing it on to you, Timothy. Now you're going to pick up the torch. At this point, you're going to move forward. At this point, you preach the word. That's what Paul tells the Ephesian elders he had done. I haven't kept back anything that was profitable to you. All scripture is given for inspiration by inspiration of God and is profitable. Paul preached the scripture. He preached all the counsel of God. He emphasized certain things. You have to major on the majors, minor on the minors. But Paul preached the word of God. All of it. That's what he tells Timothy. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. I don't know any other time besides in season and out of season. That means all the time. Reprove. Hmm. Rebuke. Hmm. If you're going to reprove and rebuke somebody, what does it mean you're doing? You're pointing out sin. That takes us back to precisely what Paul says he taught to the Ephesian elders. Exhort with all sound doctrine, with all long-suffering and doctrine. Hmm. Long-suffering. You know the difference between long-suffering and patience? Patience is dealing with difficult circumstances. Long-suffering is dealing with difficult people. <laughs> All of us, you know, pray for patience. Well, tribulation works patience. You pray for patience, you're going to have trouble. But you know, the Apostle Paul said that the most difficult things were not all the external things that he suffered, besides that which comes upon me daily, the care of the churches. It was the people they were most difficult for Paul. And that's what long-suffering, makrothumia, is all about. Timothy, do it consistently and faithfully. The people will give you grief. They won't do what you tell them to do. Any pastor knows that. They will make excuses. They will stiffen their necks. They will cross their arms. They will hunch their shoulders. With all long suffering and doctrine, just keep teaching, just keep teaching, just keep teaching, just keep teaching, just keep teaching. And doctrine relates to scripture because it's profitable. Keep back nothing that is profitable. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. You know what Paul's telling Timothy? He's telling him exactly the same thing that he told the Ephesian elders. After my departing, not only are you going to be attacked from the outside, but some of your own members, some of you guys who are leaders, some of you who are standing here on the beach with me today, are going to try to draw people after yourselves. The time will come when the congregation won't want to listen to sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they'll say, you know, I don't like to hear that. That guy preaches about sin too much. 
That guy is pointing at my sins. The preacher may not even know that's your sin. But because he preached on it, you think somebody has got some scuttlebutt going on here. Somebody has reported me to the preacher and though he didn't use my name in church today, he's preaching against me and I don't like it. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Somebody who will tickle their ears. Scratch them behind the ears like a dog likes to be scratched. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's the way you get into false doctrine. You listen to the guy who tells you what you want to hear rather than what God wants you to hear. But watch thou in all things. What is it that Paul exhorted the Ephesian elders? He exhorted them to watch. It's the word for vigilance. It's the word for being on guard. It's the word for standing there with your sword drawn, peering into the darkness, listening for even the slightest sound that the enemy may be approaching because you have the job of warning people the enemy is coming. Watch thou in all things. Timothy, is not going to be easy. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Timothy, we think of as a pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. Actually, they're written to young evangelists, men with the gift of evangelist, whose job is to plant churches, whose job is to lead people to Christ and then build them and form them into a, a local Bible-preaching church before they move on someplace else. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Paul was just talking about his ministry to the Ephesian elders, wasn't he? It was his swan song to the Ephesian elders. Second Timothy is his swan song to young Timothy, his disciple. Make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered. The time of my departure is at hand. Same thing that he said to the Ephesian elders, wasn't it? I'm about to get on board the boat. You'll never see me again. The time of my departure is at hand. They're starting to hoist the sail. The captain is shouting from the deck of the ship, all hands on board. Looks like they're getting ready to pull the gangplank up. i got to run, folks. Got to run. But here are the final things that I want to leave with you. Remember them. Remember them carefully. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul says the same thing to the Ephesian elders. He says to Timothy, I want to finish my course with joy and the ministry which has been entrusted to me. That's what he tells the Ephesian elders. That's what he's telling Timothy. Do you see the parallels? The same things that he told the Ephesian elders are the things that he is charging Timothy with because Timothy, you have to carry the torch. Ephesian elders, there at Ephesus, you have to finish your ministry. You have to carry the torch because I won't be here again to help you. I've finished my course. I've kept my faith, kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day and not unto me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And what are we talking about? He was talking about the kingdom of God. He was talking about when Jesus comes to judge. There to the Ephesian elders. That's what he tells Timothy. Think eschatologically. Think the future. Think Jesus is coming. Understand that it might be tonight. That it might be before this service ends. Because you see, that's one of the main things that transforms your life. Living in light of the imminent return of Christ. And so that's what he says next. Preach in light of the imminent return of Christ. The kingdom of God is the coming millennial rule of Christ. Now behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching, the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. That's the first verse we just read there in a moment ago in 2 Timothy 4, chapter, 1, uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. He's not talking about a mystical mystery kingdom right now. What he preached to them 
was there is coming a kingdom. And Christ will literally rule on earth. It will be at his coming. I wasn't talking about the first coming. That's already taken place. He'd already gone back to heaven. Paul preached that Jesus is coming again. Read First and Second Thessalonians. A lot of detail about it. And now he says, I've gone preaching the kingdom of God. In other words, the imminent return of Christ is one of the most powerful motivations for living the Christian life. Remember, we're not just talking theology. He says, you looked at my life. You watched me from day one until now. Can you find anything that was, was inconsistent? Because you see, Paul lived in light of the imminent return of Christ. Are you living that way? As you go through your day, does that thought pop into your mind over and over? You know, Lord Jesus might come back today. What an exciting thought. Man, I don't have, know how much time I've got left. I might drop dead of a heart attack today. You know, I, I might get killed in a car accident on my way to work or on my way home from work. You know, some horrible thing might happen to me. Uh, the government may take over and arrest all the Christians and kill us all immediately. Who knows what will happen? Paul said, I know those things are coming. I can see that uh, suffering and affliction abides me because, you know, in every city, every place I go, that's what they tell me. All the prophets in those cities tell me, hey, you know, Paul, if you go to Jerusalem, what's going to happen to you? Paul says, I oh, know. It doesn't matter. I don't count my life dear unto myself. All of us count our lives dear unto ourselves. We're always looking out for old number one. You see, what you believe in terms of the return of Christ changes the way in which you live. That was one of the key themes that Paul lists that he preached to the Ephesian elders. How do we know that the imminent return of Christ... I mean, is there any doctrinal passage that you can think of that the imminent return of Christ is life-changing so that it causes you to live a holy and godly and morally pure and upright and righteous life. If you really believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, it keeps you from walking toward darkness. Someone is tempting you, drawing you to sin. Oh, no, there are thousands of kinds of sins, and you know that. You don't have to just think about the biggies. Think about the little stuff that you do every day. And would you be proud of the fact that you were in the middle of doing that? When Jesus comes, imagine for a moment. Think about whatever sin is in your life. Say, I can't think of anything. Well, then you've got a problem. Because we're all sinners. And you're not perfect, and neither am I. I have a very easy time thinking about sins in my life and how ashamed I would be if Jesus came back and I was doing that. What do you think about? What do you talk about? What are your attitudes? A lot of us have bad attitudes. Suppose you're in the middle of a big pout and fuss because you didn't get your rights or you didn't get your way. And Jesus suddenly appeared. You say, well, that's not important. Oh, really? That's making excuses for sin. We're so used to getting into that habit of saying, well, it was a mistake, not it was sin. We're so used to avoiding repentance. I hope this passage came to your mind. I asked you, can you think of a doctrinal passage that says that the imminent return of Christ is one of the most powerful motivating factors for living a holy life? 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. In other words, we're different from the world. If you can blend in with the world around you, there's a problem in your life. We are supposed to stick out. We are supposed to be different. Verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, 
and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. You know, you can see God's transforming grace in your life now. I hope you can. But you know, something better is coming. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know when He shall appear. Now, what was Paul writing to Timothy? I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, so judge the quick and the dead, at His appearing. His parousia. His manifestation. At His appearing and His kingdom. That's, that's future tense. Paul write, or John writes the same thing. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. For we shall see Him as He is. Are you looking forward to seeing Jesus? Are you looking forward to it? I am. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Because when we see Him, we will be like Him. You see, we're going to see Him at the rapture. And we're going to be, going to be metamorphosized. We're going to be changed. That's the Greek word, metamorphosis, that's used by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be changed. We'll be like Him. We will see Him as He is. At that moment, our bodies will be transformed just like a, a grubby little caterpillar gets transformed through its cocoon or through its chrysalis, either into a moth or into a butterfly. That's a metamorphosis. That's what's going to happen to our physical bodies. They're going to be the same bodies. We're going to be the same people, but we're going to be transformed metamorphosized. We know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now here's the motivation. Verse 3. Does that motivate you to holy living? It should. That's what John says here in 1 John 3, 3. Every man that hath this hope in him but the hope that you'll see Christ, that you're going to be transformed, that He could appear at any moment. Every man that hath this hope in Him, Paul calls it the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. John's talking about His appearing. Paul calls it the glorious appearing. He calls it the blessed hope in his epistle to Titus, chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. Every man that hath this hope in him, the blessed hope that Jesus could come back at any moment, every man that hath this hope in him. Are you focused on it? On Christ coming back? Every man that hath this hope in him, what does he do? What does he do if you have that hope in you? What do you do? Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. How pure was Jesus? And everything that he said, everything that he did, every one of his motives, every one of his thought patterns, every one of his activities. How pure was he? Every man that hath this hope, that is, Christ could come back at this moment. Christ could come back at this moment. Christ could come back at this moment. I'm excited about it. Jesus, I can see him this moment, this very next moment, he might be here. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as He is pure. How pure was Jesus? That should be your motivation for living. What you believe in your head, if you really believe it, not merely know it, if you really believe it, it is transformational. I hope you take away, if you take away nothing else this evening, remember what is truly believed in your heart is transformational. It changes your life. You say you're a Christian? So how has it changed your life? Our time is up, but there's one more thing here. He says, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. You know, you and I are going to be held accountable for not preaching all the counsel of God. We're playing favorites with people. People begin to say something and we keep our mouths shut. Instead of saying, you know, the Bible says. 
or pastor or an elder or deacon who has responsibility for someone under them in the church. And they know there's a particular sin in that person's life, and so they don't want to be too offensive, and so they never say anything about it. I have not shunned to declare unto you. Ooh, I'm going to shun that. I can keep that one away. Ooh, ooh, let's not let, let's not bring that one to the table. If we bring that one to the table, somebody will get offended. I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. The temptation to compromise is great. I want to look out of some Old Testament prophets who face that temptation to compromise, but we're going to have to use that for next, wait for next week for that. Also, Paul says, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God that I am pure from the blood of all men. That's what he immediately said in verse 26. Did you know he's quoting a couple of passages, in fact, a couple of extended passages in the Old Testament when he says to them, therefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. He's making a specific reference to someone that God said in the Old Testament, if you don't preach what I tell you to preach, their blood is going to be on your hands. Paul knew the Old Testament and he alludes to it and there's a very important transdispensational principle that's involved here why we preach from the Old Testament even though we're under the age of grace now. Well, those things are going to have to wait for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power, for the privilege we have of having the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And is profitable. Paul declared the whole counsel of God. He didn't hold back on those things that dealt with sin. He preached repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He preached how the Word of God is transformational. It changes lives. He preached prophetically. He told them about the coming kingdom of God because that's transformational. Every man that has this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Father, we thank you for this summary that Paul gave to us. He preached everything. He majored on the majors. But he preached it all. He held nothing back because he knew that he would be held accountable for those to whom he had preached. They're accountable for what they do and how they respond, but he was accountable to communicate the word. Help us to remember that in our communications, it's a communication of the word of God. Father, help us to preach those things and to teach those things and to live those things, which are the proof of what we really believe. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.